surprise. Wouldn't your wife or girlfriend love it if you treated her to the very best this Christmas? Now you can with the world's softest pajamas by Pajamagram. Created by a team of pajama experts, the world's softest PJs are lighter than a cloud, softer than a bunny, like cashmere, only better. She'll love how heavenly they feel. Includes free gift packaging and Christmas delivery is guaranteed. So visit pajamagram.com or call 1-800-GIVE-PJs. This, this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. What's going on, everybody? A good Friday afternoon, the 15th day of December, 2017. Dan Gross is sitting in for Stephen A. Here on ESPN Radio, it's 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776, the telephone number. Busy football weekend. We even got ourselves some Saturday football. And I'm not just talking about, like, the garbage Thursday night football that we're used to and we were reminded of again last night, right, with the Broncos and the Colts, and you knew that that wasn't going to exactly be saved in a time capsule and sent off to the Hall of Fame. But tomorrow you get a couple of interesting matchups. You got Bears and you got Lions. Lions still hanging in there in the playoff race in the NFC in terms of the wild card. And then for all intents and purposes, tomorrow night you got yourself what amounts to the AFC West Championship game between the Chargers and between the Kansas City Chiefs out at Arrowhead. It's going to be loud. It's going to be cold. It's going to be rowdy. And we'll talk about all those and more with our pal Dan Graziano of ESPN coming up a little bit later in the program so a huge week 15 in the national football league not just those games but of course we have the return of one aaron Rodgers as he goes into carolina to see if he can continue to resurrect the packers postseason hopes need a lot of help and you got to keep winning but certainly with number 12 under center you have yourself a puncher's chance anytime he takes the field so you got packers and panthers you got the rams going into seattle which you know could also be viewed almost as the championship game for the nfc west to an extent because boy if the rams can get this one and move two up on the seahawks plus avenge that earlier loss they had against them out at the coliseum that'll really have them sitting pretty with two games remaining in the season and then you got the two heavyweights the two titans in the afc he got the patriots he got the steelers and i know you and i were talking about that game earlier in the week i guess it was back on tuesday after the pats fell on monday night against the dolphins and we had a lot to say about that patriot Steeler game, and I'll just keep saying it again. You can disagree with me if you want, but I don't think there's any way the Steelers win this game this week. Just because Brady and Belichick have had the upper hand on Pittsburgh pretty much since they've been together. And Brady's numbers against the Pats, or excuse me, against the Steelers, are staggering. Absolutely staggering. So we'll get into all those and more with Dan and with you as well. A lot of good football on the agenda here for a week number 15 in the National Football League. And if you want to tweet at me, you can do it at Dan Grasa, G-R-A-C-A. And of course, to be part of the program, it's 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. I want to start with some NBA because last night you had a game over in Brooklyn between the Knicks and the Nets. You know, the cross-town rivals, if you will. And I mean, you could call it a rivalry if you want. You could call it a rivalry by geography. That's nice. But I mean, is there really even a rivalry? And I keep asking myself that question. Is there really even a rivalry? Because again, last night, you would have thought that game was at Madison Square Garden. You really, you would have thought that it was a Knicks home game because it sounded like a Knicks home game. You know, all the Knicks fans are going to go to Brooklyn and they're going to infiltrate that building and they're going to be rooting hard for the Knickerbockers. And ever, and you know, it reminds me, and I keep thinking back to what is it now? Five years ago, when the Nets made the trek over from New Jersey to Brooklyn, and all you heard about was, "Oh yeah, watch out, Knicks better watch out here," because the Nets are going to move to Brooklyn. They're going to have a brand new identity. They're going to be able to tap into that Knicks fan base, and they're going to steal some of their headlines, some of their attention, and some of their fans. When is that going to happen? By the way, right? When is that going to happen? Could somebody give me like a definitive date when that's going to happen? Like, is it going to happen next week? Is it going to happen next year? Is it going to happen in five years? I mean, is it going to happen right around the time the Nets win that championship that Mikhail Prokhorov promised that they would win in the first five years after he bought the team? Or are we still hoping out on that one? You know, are they going to trade away? Is Billy, they going to rehire Billy King? Is he going to trade away about 15 more first round picks? Before the Nets get some fans, are they going to trade away five first round picks in, in exchange for Nick fans? What are they going to do? But the bottom line is this. Knicks get a road win last night, right? They had to. 
Only their second one of the season. And, hey, it's a win. A win is a win is a win. You take it. And if the Knicks are going to be a playoff team this year in the NBA, you can't just stock up on home wins. You have to be able to win some games outside of Madison Square Garden. And they've been as bad a road team as there is in the NBA. So for them to win the game last night, they had a big lead, fell behind in the third quarter, and for them to come back and still find a way to get it done is a step in the right direction. It's a positive. Now, the negative. And that's Kristaps Porzingis again leaving this game banged up, sore left knee. They say it's precaution more than anything else, but how many times is this going to keep happening, right? I mean, we're 28 games into the season. And he's already got enough bumps and bruises and aches and pains to really make you concerned. As you should be. This is the unicorn. This is the face of the franchise. This is a guy who, remember, those first 10 games of the season, people were handing him the most valuable player award. Right? And he shows you time and time again just how special his skill set is. And how lethal a player he is. I mean, think about the things he did the other night against the Los Angeles Lakers. In that game at Madison Square Garden. First player in NBA history. The history of the NBA. To put up at least 35 points, 10 rebounds, 5 blocks, and 5 three-pointers in one game. All right, he's seven foot three, and he can play the game like he's a 6-foot point guard. He's a special talent. But you always have to be concerned about his well-being. You always have to be concerned that this guy's going to go down now it remains to be seen if he's going to be able to get back out on the floor in time for tomorrow night's homecoming for Carmelo Anthony and not to say that it's the end of the world if he doesn't play but you would like to see him out there right as we kind of get a look of the old Knicks guard versus the new Knicks guard with Melo you want to see KP out there too the old versus the new and the Knicks have turned the page. They've moved on from the Carmelo Anthony tenure. That's, that's evident. And bigger and better things are expected. You'd like to see KP out there, but not if it's going to jeopardize him not being healthy because he can't keep playing this game constantly, worrying that he's going to get injured, he's going to go down, because then what do you have? And that's why I thought last night's game, now granted, they didn't beat the Boston Celtics, all right? They didn't beat Golden State. But I think that still you have to take it as a positive last night because they fell behind in the third quarter. It was kind of shell shock for them. And it was more on the defensive end than anything else. All right? The fact that they fell behind and collected themselves and gathered themselves without Kristaps Porzingis. And oh, by the way, still without Tim Hardaway. So you got your number one and your number two scoring options down for the count basically the entire second half of that game last night. And they still found a way to win. And Tim Hardaway spoke before the game, and doesn't sound like he's going to be back anytime soon. He's going to be reevaluated in another week, and hey, I'm not a doctor. I don't have any inside information, but I think the Knicks are going to proceed with the utmost caution when you're talking about Tim Hardaway. And you're probably not going to see him until 2018 at the earliest. At the earliest. When? I have no idea. But Jeff Hornacek, again, getting contributions from his second unit. You know, that bench last night, 45 points, and they've contributed. Michael Beasley, 15 points, bringing some energy, bringing some attitude on the offensive end. Frank Nielakina, eight more assists, continuing to be more comfortable in guiding this offense and playing important minutes, by the way, right? Frank Nielakina may not be the starting point guard for the New York Knicks, but guess who's in the game running the offense at crunch time? It ain't Jared Jack, and no knock on him. Right? Frank is getting those minutes late in the game. How about Ron Baker coming off the bench last night and making some big plays defensively, back-to-back strips, which led to a bucket from Courtney Lee and then a three-pointer from Courtney Lee, giving the Knicks some breathing room. You like the makeup of this team. They're gutty. They play hard. And Jeff Hornacek, with each passing game, is showing that he has confidence in those guys on his bench. I mean, it's almost out of necessity at this point, too, when you're talking about the guys who are on the shelf and losing Porzingis. you got to find somebody else to pick up the slack offensively, and last night it was Courtney Lee. And I don't know if they have a third guy that they can rely on night in and night out. It might take a collaborative effort. But this is a fun Knicks team. We say that time and time again. 
And they probably should be a playoff team this year. You know, I know that's maybe setting the bar a little high, but look around this Eastern Conference. Tell me why they can't be a playoff team. Tell me why it's so outrageous that this team can't play postseason basketball. They got to improve that record away from Madison Square Garden. I'll give you that. Guys, wouldn't your wife or girlfriend love it if you treated her to the very best this Christmas? Now you can, with the world's softest pajamas by Pajamagram. Created by a team of pajama experts, the world's softest PJs are lighter than a cloud, softer than a bunny, like cashmere, only better. She'll love how heavenly they feel. Includes free gift packaging and Christmas delivery is guaranteed. So visit pajamagram.com or call 1-800-GIVE-PJs. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. What's going on, everybody? A good Friday afternoon, the 15th day of December, 2017. Dan Gross is sitting in for Stephen A. Here on ESPN Radio, it's 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776, the telephone number. Busy football weekend. We even got ourselves some Saturday football. And I'm not just talking about, like, the garbage Thursday night football that we're used to and we were reminded of again last night, right, with the Broncos and the Colts, and you knew that that wasn't going to exactly be saved in a time capsule and sent off to the Hall of Fame. But tomorrow you get a couple of interesting matchups. You got Bears and you got Lions. Lions still hanging in there in the playoff race in the NFC in terms of the wild card. And then for all intents and purposes, tomorrow night you got yourself what amounts to the AFC West Championship game between the Chargers and between the Kansas City Chiefs out at Arrowhead. It's going to be loud. It's going to be cold. It's going to be rowdy. And we'll talk about all those and more with our pal Dan Graziano of ESPN coming up a little bit later in the program. So a huge Week 15 in the National Football League, not just those games, but of course we have the return of one Aaron Rodgers as he goes into Carolina to see if he can continue to resurrect the Packers' postseason hopes. Need a lot of help, and you got to keep winning, but certainly with number 12 under center, you have yourself a puncher's chance anytime he takes the field. So you got Packers and Panthers, you got the Rams going into Seattle, which you know could also be viewed almost as the championship game for the NFC West to extent because boy if the Rams can get this one and move two up on the Seahawks plus avenge that earlier loss they had against them out at the Coliseum that'll really have them sitting pretty with two games remaining in the season and then you got the two heavyweights the two Titans in the AFC he got the Patriots he got the Steelers and I know you and I were talking about that game earlier in the week I guess it was back on Tuesday after the Pats fell on Monday night against the Dolphins. And we had a lot to say about that patriots Steeler game, and I'll just keep saying it again. You can disagree with me if you want, but I don't think there's any way the Steelers win this game this week. Just because Brady and Belichick have had the upper hand on Pittsburgh pretty much since they've been together. And Brady's numbers against the Pats, or excuse me, against the Steelers are staggering. Absolutely staggering. So we'll get into all those and more with Dan and with you as well. A lot of good football on the agenda here for a week number 15 in the National Football League. And if you want to tweet at me, you can do it at Dan Grasa, G-R-A-C-A. And of course, to be part of the program, it's 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. I want to start with some NBA because last night you had a game over in Brooklyn between the Knicks and the Nets. You know, the cross-town rivals, if you will. And I mean, you could call it a rivalry if you want. You could call it a rivalry by geography. That's nice. But I mean, is there really even a rivalry? And I keep asking myself that question. Is there really even a rivalry? Because again, last night, you would have thought that game was at Madison Square Garden. You really, you would have thought that it was a Knicks home game because it sounded like a Knicks home game. You know, all the Knicks fans are going to go to Brooklyn and they're going to infiltrate that building and they're going to be rooting hard for the Knickerbockers. And ever, and you know, it reminds me, and I keep thinking back to what is it now? Five years ago, when the Nets made the trek over from New Jersey to Brooklyn, and all you heard about was, "Oh yeah, watch out, Knicks better watch out here," because the Nets are going to move to Brooklyn. They're going to have a brand new identity. They're going to be able to tap into that Knicks fan base, and they're going to steal some of their headlines, some of their attention, and some of their fans. When is that going to happen? By the way, right? When is that going to happen? Could somebody give me like a definitive date when that's going to happen? Like, is it going to happen next week? Is it going to happen next year? Is it going to happen in five years? I mean, is it going to happen right around the time the Nets win that championship that Mikhail Prokhorov promised that they would win in the first five years after he bought the team? 
Or are we still hoping out on that one? You know, are they going to trade away? Is Billy, they going to rehire Billy King? Is he going to trade away about 15 more first round picks before the Nets get some fans? Are they going to trade away five first round picks in, in exchange for Nick fans? What are they going to do? But the bottom line is this. Knicks get a road win last night, right? They had to. Only their second one of the season. And, hey, it's a win. A win is a win is a win. You take it. And if the Knicks are going to be a playoff team this year in the NBA, you can't just stock up on home wins. You have to be able to win some games outside of Madison Square Garden. And they've been as bad a road team as there is in the NBA. So for them to win the game last night, they had a big lead, fell behind in the third quarter, and for them to come back and still find a way to get it done is a step in the right direction. It's a positive. Now, the negative. And that's Kristaps Porzingis again leaving this game banged up, sore left knee. They say it's precaution more than anything else, but how many times is this going to keep happening, right? I mean, we're 28 games into the season, and he's already got enough bumps and bruises and aches and pains to really make you concerned, as you should be. This is the unicorn. This is the face of the franchise. This is a guy who, remember, those first 10 games of the season, people were handing him the most valuable player award, right? And he shows you time and time again just how special his skill set is and how lethal a player he is. I mean, think about the things he did the other night against the Los Angeles Lakers in that game at Madison Square Garden. First player in NBA history, the history of the NBA. To put up at least 35 points, 10 rebounds, 5 blocks, and 5 three-pointers in one game. All right, he's seven foot three, and he can play the game like he's a 6-foot point guard. He's a special talent. But you always have to be concerned about his well-being. You always have to be concerned that this guy's going to go down. Now, it remains to be seen if he's going to be able to get back out on the floor in time for tomorrow night's homecoming for Carmelo Anthony, and not to say that it's the end of the world if he doesn't play, but you would like to see him out there, right? As we kind of get a look of the old Knicks guard versus the new Knicks guard with Melo, you want to see KP out there too. The old versus the new. And the Knicks have turned the page. They moved on from the Carmelo Anthony tenure. That's, That's evident. And bigger and better things are expected. You'd like to see KP out there, but not if it's going to jeopardize him not being healthy because he can't keep playing this game constantly worrying that he's going to get injured, he's going to go down, because then what do you have? And that's why I thought last night's game, now granted, they didn't beat the Boston Celtics, all right? they didn't beat Golden State, but I think that still you have to take it as a positive last night because they fell behind in the third quarter. It was kind of shell shock for them. And it was more on the defensive end than anything else. All right? The fact that they fell behind and collected themselves and gathered themselves without Kristaps Porzingis. And, oh, by the way, still without Tim Hardaway. So you got your number one and your number two scoring options down for the count basically the entire second half of that game last night. And they still found a way to win. And Tim Hardaway spoke before the game and doesn't sound like he's going to be back anytime soon. He's going to be reevaluated in another week. And, hey... I'm not a doctor. I don't have any inside information, but I think the Knicks are going to proceed with the utmost caution when you're talking about Tim Hardaway. And you're probably not going to see him until 2018 at the earliest. At the earliest. When? I have no idea. But Jeff Hornacek, again, getting contributions from his second unit. You know, that bench last night, 45 points, and they've contributed. Michael Beasley, 15 points, bringing some energy, bringing some attitude on the offensive end. Frank Nielakina, eight more assists, continuing to be more comfortable in guiding this offense and playing important minutes, by the way, right? Frank Nielakina may not be the starting point guard for the New York Knicks, but guess who's in the game running the offense at crunch time? It ain't Jared Jack, and no knock on him, right? Frank is getting those minutes late in the game. How about Ron Baker coming off the bench last night? and making some big plays defensively, back-to-back strips, which led to a bucket from Courtney Lee and then a three-pointer from Courtney Lee, giving the Knicks some breathing room. You like the makeup of this team. They're gutty. They play hard. And Jeff Hornacek, with each passing game, is showing that he has confidence in those guys on his bench. I mean, it's almost out of necessity at this point, too, when you're talking about 
the guys who are on the shelf and losing Porzingis, you got to find somebody else to pick up the slack offensively. And last night it was Courtney Lee. And I don't know if they have a third guy that they can rely on night in and night out. It might take a collaborative effort. But this is a fun Knicks team. We say that time and time again. And they probably should be a playoff team this year. You know, I know that's an unfair rap. I mean, true, he's supposed to be the savior, but this is a team sport, and he can't do it by himself, and he never really had a supporting cast aside from the year when they went to the playoffs. And and that's my take on Melo. You know, I, I like Melo. He's not what he used to be, but he's still a good player. But his time with the Knicks, you know, he got an unfair rap as far as uh, teammates. Because, like I said, they went to the playoffs, second round, and then they fired the coach and they got the team. I mean, what is he supposed to do from there? Right. You're right, Alan. A good phone call, my friend. I appreciate it. And, and I'll keep saying this. If you want to talk about the best thing that happened to Carmelo Anthony as a New York Nick, the best thing and the worst thing. Let's think about it. All wrapped up into one was Phil Jackson. Right? The best thing that happened to Carmelo was Phil Jackson in the sense that he became, as we said, a sympathetic figure, I think, to a lot of people. Because Phil Jackson seemed like it was just his mission to go out there and trash this guy whenever he had the opportunity. And to point the finger to Adam and to needle him any which way he could. And to send all these little messages about Carmelo Anthony that he wasn't getting the job done, on and on and on, and it's his fault. But again, Phil Jackson was the one who re-signed him, and I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. I I said it then, when he was a free agent a few years ago in that summer, and Phil decided to re-up him again. The argument to make there was that when the Knicks were good again, and I mean ready to contend, you know, back to being one of the marquee teams in the Eastern Conference, when that day came, if it ever came, did you really think that Carmelo Anthony was still going to be a number one bona fide scoring option for this team? And the answer is no. The answer is no, and it never happened. I mean, look at where he is right now in his career, right? He's not number one. And he's on a better basketball team, at least on paper, than he had in New York the last few years, and... They haven't won. Worst thing for Carmelo with with Phil Jackson was the fact that Phil put together a horrible basketball team. More on this, plus we'll get into the Lonzo Ball, LeBron James conversation from last night. Pretty interesting stuff, by the way, even though it was only a couple of lines. Dan Gross in for Stephen A. It's ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Dan Grossman for Stephen A. It's ESPN Radio on a Friday. Going to be a good sports weekend. Man, we got a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Even got the start of bowl season tomorrow. I think there's like five or six games. I love the bowls, by the way. Love the bowls. If I could, I'd sit and watch each and every one of them. I, I, I'm, I'm being dead serious. Love the bowls. It's fun football. 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. Dan Graziano, not Dan Grasso. We'll join us at the top of the hour, talk a little NFL, hopefully check in with our pal R.J. Bell from Vegas, go through some of these lines of the Week 15 action coming up this weekend. Let's say hi to David in California. David, you're on ESPN Radio. How are you? David, going once. David, you there? All right, let's move on from David. Let's say hi to Devin in Richmond. Devin, you're on ESPN Radio. How are you? Hey, good, Dan. Thanks for standing in for uh, Stephen A. today. Um, I was calling because I, I heard, you, you know, your comment about, you know, Carmelo and how that situation was just, you know, tumultuous and say the least in New York. But it was funny because when, when you said it, you said you made a statement about, like, you know, that's the problem when the guys get to decide. And, you know, I just was like, I thought that comment was kind of reckless because, when you think about it, like, if you would, I mean, I don't think you could argue that Carmelo, regardless of what's going to the Hall of Fame, mm-hmm. you know, maybe not now, but was the top 50 player in the league if he's not now, still, you know. Um, and he's a brand, you know what I mean? Like, he's a brand, you know, when his career is over, you know, he's, you know, he don't want to sit on a set and beat Charles Barkley without no ring, so he should have control, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the media gets to bash him. Either which way, so, I mean, give him that take. But, you know, he's not lucky to be Tim Duncan or even um, even though I don't like Mark Cuban, he's done a great job with Dirk Nowitzki. 
basically showing homage and respect to him and making him a part of that franchise. Everybody doesn't get that. You know what I mean? But people do can put in those clauses where they can. And when you're a top 50 player, you should. I mean, you should because at the end of the day, like, they're going to blame you for GM decisions where you couldn't get players that will help you win championships and whatnot. And, you know, I just felt like, you know, to say that is not fair when at the end of the career we're going to judge him on whether he won or not, not whether he had the right support or he was in the right situation. You know what I mean? I, I, I hear it. Look, I hear what you're saying. And by the way, Devin, I don't think it was reckless what I said it. I mean, it's fact. Now, now the, the player doesn't care, and any other player out there doesn't care, because if they could get the same deal, they'd do it themselves. But you brought up a couple of people, and you dropped a couple of names who are contemporaries of, of Carmelo. Dwayne Wade. Dirk Nowitzki. History is going to show that those two guys are better players than Carmelo Anthony. It's got nothing to do with championships either. Okay, Dirk is a better player than Carmelo all time. Dwayne Wade's a better player than Carmelo all time. I mean, Carmelo's nice. I mean, he's a good player. He's not a scrub. All right, an All Star player, but he's not like this immortal, you know, once in a generation player. Let's let's remember something. He was never a first team All NBA guy in his life. Never. So he was never considered one of the top five players in the NBA in any year. No, I feel you, but, I mean, he's still a guy you start a franchise with. You're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to pick random dude over Carmelo because Carmelo can score, he can bring in a crowd. Even if we don't win, we're going to make money because he's, you know, he's someone you can, you know, you know, pull your hold. You know what I mean? Like, mm, Yeah, uh, I, I, I hear what, you know, Devin, I hear what you're saying, and I thank you for the phone call. Maybe I just never warmed up to Carmelo like others did. You know, and I know that he had that great run in Syracuse the one year, won Jim Beheim his national championship. That's great. But you know what? A lot of guys have won in college. And then they come to the NBA and they can't play. So you can't link the two. He's a scorer. It's what he is. That's what he was. That's what he'll always be. Not much else. Not much else. I'll ask you a question right now. You know, if you could go back and... To Carmelo when he was coming into the league. Way the heck back in, what was that, 2003 with LeBron and Wade and Bosh and all those guys. And you knew then what you know now about a guy like Carl Anthony Towns. And I gave you the pick. You starting your team building it around Carl Anthony Towns or, or Carmelo? I'll take Cat. Any day of the week. And twice on Sunday. 866-ESPN. Raheem's on the road, and now he's on ESPN Radio. Raheem, how you doing? Dan, yeah, thanks for taking me back. I could not agree with you for a lot of years, and I argue. Raheem, let me put you back on hold. We got to get that. Raheem, let me put you back on hold. We want to get that line straightened out, and I especially like the fact that you agree with me, so we really want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I'm kidding, but we'll get that line straightened out. Uh, let's try Densi in the Bronx. Dents, what's going on? today, Dan. Dan, good to hear from you. What's up? The Carmelo Anthony's time with the Knicks was tumultuous and rocky at best. And when yeah. he was coming over from the, when he was coming over from Denver, I wanted him, but he did it to himself. This was his own fault because he wanted to get paid rather than just reassure, rather than just waiting till the end of the season and come to a Knicks team that was already built at least somewhat good around him. He decided to force that trade and made us give up a whole bunch of players that he would have come into a, a, a Knicks team, which would have been a lot more competitive. For him, we gave up what? We gave up, I think, Felton. We gave up Wilson Chandler. We gave up Danilo Gallinari. That should he have just stayed and waited till the end of the season rather than force that trade at that point in time, he would have come into a much stronger team, which would have had many more playoffs throughout the years. So, in, in, and honestly, he did it for himself. Instead of doing what Dwayne Wade and, and LeBron did where they, uh, they tried to do the best for the team so that they can get people around him and the money wasn't as important. I mean, it's always important, but not as important. He, he did the opposite. He forced the trade because he wanted to get the, the, the maximum amount of money that he can get and, and get that sign and trade done rather than waiting until the end of the season to come into a team that was kind of stocked up in a way. Yeah, you're right about look, and, and the package at the time, you know, they weren't superstars when you're talking about Chandler and Gallinari and guys like that, but, you know, they, they, they were good young players. They had some ability and, and they had their moments with Denver, you know, helped that Denver team win a couple of basketball games. Now it was a sordid tale because 
you know, they got injured, especially in a case like Gallinari, and they've been well-traveled and everything. And the Knicks maybe didn't have that team success like Carmelo would have hoped and that they would have hoped, right, when they brought him over there. And it kind of, in a weird way, kind of just threw their whole plan out of whack, right? Because Donnie Walsh came in and he cleared up the mess that the Knicks were in, if you don't remember, if, if you don't forget, right? They were in cap hell. Hell. He got rid of the guys like Zach Randolph and Jamal Crawford and did the best he could to put this team at a level and at a position to where, all right, we could start to build it back up again. We could start to bring in some young talent, sign some free, you know, make some big trades, bring in some established talent like they did. But then they kind of lost their way a little bit, right? They lost their way, and then Donnie Walsh's influence started to grow smaller and smaller and smaller on the franchise. And then they got themselves into the film mess. And look, I don't fault, I'll keep saying this, I don't fault the people in charge, i.e. Jim Dolan, for throwing all that money at Phil Jackson. And that's why when I hear people say, oh, Dolan doesn't want to win, no, he paid the guy $12 million a year, reportedly. Why would you throw all that money around if you don't want to win? Just why? Just because you have the money and you want to throw it around? You open up the window and throw that money out the window? It doesn't work that way. He thought that Phil Jackson was a guy that would be able to deliver this team some good times. Didn't work out. But to say that he didn't want to win or he doesn't care, that's silly. That's ridiculous. 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. We'll talk to Dan Graziano at the top of the hour, a little NFL. We'll continue with your phone calls coming up. And also, what did LeBron say to Lonzo Ball last night after the Cavs beat the Lakers? Interesting. We'll talk about that. It's Dan Grossin for Stephen A. It's ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Dan Grossin for Stephen A. We're rolling till 3 o'clock Eastern here on ESPN Radio. 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. So the Cavaliers beat the Lakers last night in Cleveland. Lakers lose their second straight on the road. They lost to Madison Square Garden in overtime earlier this week. But it was LeBron against Lonzo. And then after the game, you know, LeBron being the elder statesman, of course, of the NBA. And I'm sure a guy that Lonzo Ball looked up to and many other young players look up to. And now the first chance to share the same court with him in the NBA. After the game, LeBron goes up to him and the cameras were on him. And he had a little heart-to-heart with Lonzo. And so LeBron says to him, quote, Find your zone and just stay blank locked in. The media is going to ask you what I told you right now. Tell them nothing. Just be aggressive every single day. It's white noise to you. That's all it is. All right? Let's go. So doesn't have to tell the media because the cameras were on him and it picked up everything. And we can't use the audio or else we would just play it for you. So Lonzo doesn't have to keep the secret because the secret's out. And for those that didn't hear, I just told you anyway. So... That's why I mean, you know, all positive stuff, and you admire him for that. I can't wait to hear the conversation, like, at the end of the season when LeBron probably gives serious consideration to going out to L.A., considering he, what, owns a couple of homes out there. But I thought it was kind of funny that, and the thing that struck me more than anything else is when I saw that, LeBron ended the conversation by saying, let's go, right? Let's go. That sounded so cool to me. It really did. Like, I'm going to start doing that from now on. Like, no matter what, no matter what, and you should do it too. Like, I need to get to that level to where I'm having a conversation with somebody and it doesn't matter what I'm saying, I'm just going to end it with let's go. Like, how cool is that? Like, that, that is going to be a personal goal of mine here. That, that, that is my New Year's resolution. That is going to be incorporated into my vocabulary. So whenever we do the shows, I'm going to end each segment with let's go. What is better than that? Like, imagine if you're at the grocery store, and you're at the deli counter, and you're ordering some 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 cold cuts and some lunch meat, and you say to the guy, you know, and they say, hi, can I help you? And you say, yeah, let me get a, uh, a half a pound of turkey and a quarter pound of salami. Let's go. Now, some people might interpret that as, you know, I'm like telling the guy, you know, let's go, like speed it up. No, but then you got to keep saying it so he knows that that's just how you roll, right? And that's part of the vocabulary. I think that's so cool. But, you know, with this Lakers team, all kidding aside, though, I was there at the Garden on Tuesday night doing the game for the Knicks, the pre and the post. 
And the Lakers got a lot of athletes. I mean, they really do. They, they, they've got guys who can get up and down the floor. You know, Brandon Ingram has taken a nice step in the NBA here. Caldwell Pope is a guy that could score. You know, Lonzo's only going to get better. And this is far from a finished product. And you know that, you know, Kyle Kuzma, I mean, my God, Kyle Kuzma's been the best rookie for the Lakers, not Lonzo Ball. And they're going to go out there and they're going to incorporate another primo free agent or two, whether it's LeBron, whether it's somebody else. They've got some play. I mean, even a guy like Jordan Clarkson, for crying out loud, coming off the bench. You know, Julius Randle's the guy who just hasn't gotten to the level that everybody thought he was. Larry Nance, guy that's got some serious hops. They're not a finished product yet, but you can at least see they play an exciting brand of basketball. 866-ESPN. Rashad's calling from Hawaii. We got to take this call. Rashad, why aren't you at the beach? What's going on? Well, I'm not, I'm not at the beach because it's 9 in the morning here. So Never too early for the beach, beach, Rashad. Come on. <laughs> uh, no, I appreciate you taking my call. So I was listening yesterday, and, and there's a lot of LeVar bashing, and, and I get it. I mean, and I think a lot of it has to do with his dad making making him out to be like the second coming of Jesus Christ. But I was looking at the stats as a top three in the draft, and Lonzo Ball has the best stats, and he almost averages a triple-double. And you got LeBron coming to, coming to his aid, basically telling everybody, kind of just chill with the kid, let him come into his own. I'm not even a Lakers fan, but the kid almost averages a triple-double. So why are we bashing him so much? Because he doesn't average a triple-double to most people. I mean, I'm just being honest with you, Rashad, and I thank you for the phone call, and please go enjoy Hawaii. You know, Lonzo's been okay. You know, has he come in and, you know, averaged 15 and, and 10 and 10? No, but he's getting there. And remember, the, sc- the, the scoring part of it was something that was probably going to be minimized when you're talking about Lonzo and the things that he was going to be able to bring to a basketball team. Right? The Jason Kidd comparisons. Jason Kidd was never a lethal score. Jason Kidd, though, scored when he had to score. Right? When he had to put the ball in the basket, when he had to make shots, he did that. But he was more the facilitator, just like Magic was. Same thing. Scored when he had to score. But nobody's going to be that level. I mean, that's that's like Mount Rushmore level. But give Lonzo credit. He's handled himself well. Has, has Lonzo stepped out of line in any way, shape, or form since coming into the NBA or even in the last couple of years? Given everything surrounding him, his brother is a thief, his father can't keep his mouth shut, on and on and on and on, and playing under all that pressure and all that spotlight. He's distinguished himself very, very well. We'll get back to the NBA a little bit later on. We'll do some NFL talk, a huge Week 15 slate coming up this weekend. Dan Graziano of ESPN will join me on the other side. It's Dan Grasa. On ESPN Radio. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. Guys, wouldn't your wife or girlfriend love it if you treated her to the very best this Christmas? Now you can with the world's softest pajamas by Pajamagram. Created by a team of pajama experts, the world's softest PJs are lighter than a cloud, softer than a bunny, like cashmere, only better. She'll love how heavenly they feel. Includes free gift packaging and Christmas delivery is guaranteed. So visit pajamagram.com or call 1-800-GIVE-PJs. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Welcome back. Dan Gross is sitting in for Stephen A. here on ESPN Radio, 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. Talk a little Week 15 NFL now with a gentleman who I'm glad is on the show with me today because there is a tremendous amount of Twitter confusion between the two of us. So this will prove to the world that we are indeed two different people. I'm Dan Grassa, <laughs> and my guest, ESPN's Dan Graziano. Two different people, Grassa Graziano, but he's a good friend nonetheless. Danny, how are you? Thanks for joining me. I'm good. Yeah, the people who are listening, I have to understand. Like, I'll be on Twitter, and all of a sudden, I'll get like three straight tweets about something, something I said about the Knicks or something like that. I'm like, <laughs> what are these folks talking about? As oh, Dan must be on the radio, uh, and they're just you know because you type it into Twitter, and then it kind of auto fills, uh, and it probably gets to me sometimes. So that's probably what happened. But yeah, it's uh, it's fun sometimes. I like to hear what you're talking about through Twitter. 
if and I you're always to you on the radio. And you always get caught up that way too. Everybody's keeping an eye on yep. things. So we we are two different people, folks. So that's uh, that's why we wanted to have Dan on today. But all kidding aside, the word coming down a little while ago regarding the Jets, who were a very prohibitive underdog this weekend in New Orleans. But Muhammad Wilkerson, who's already been disciplined multiple times in the last couple of years, Todd Bowles making the announcement that Mo Wilkerson will not make the trip down to New Orleans. I guess this basically pretty much seals his fate, if there was any doubt about his future with the team. Right, Dan? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, this is a... You know, they locked him up um, with a long-term deal at the at the franchise deadline a couple of years ago. I think it was, I think it was summer of 2016. It was kind of a surprise. It seemed like they weren't ready to commit to him long-term. Uh, and they, they did, you know, quote unquote, as much as anyone ever does. Look, if they were to cut him or trade him this off season, they would save $11 million on next year's cap, still eat about 9 million in dead money. But you know, there's three years left of that deal. None of it's guaranteed. And, um, and yeah, it would seem like if he's a guy that we're getting to this point in the season where these kinds of things are happening and we hear the lateness has continued to be a problem. Um, you know, I, I assume that at this point, I'm not assuming, I, I, I would I would hedge that Todd Bowles is probably coming back as their coach given how well they've played under him this year. We don't know for sure. But uh, if he has any say in the matter, you would think they're moving on. I mean, we've seen discipline situations like this where, where the relationship could come back. But it seems like it's been going on a while. And, again, when they did that deal, only guaranteed it through 2017. So they can move on if they want to after this year. You think this reflects positively on Todd Bowles? I mean, it's one of two ways you could go, Dan. One is that, you know, these guys are maybe testing him a little bit in the repeated pattern of lateness. But on the other hand, you know, maybe he had a little bit of a longer leash at the get-go. But now he is trying to rule with the iron fist, if you will. And there is punishment and there are measures if you do cross the line. Yeah, I mean, you gotta you got to take it. You, know, you had to assess it within its circumstances, right? I mean, when maybe there was a point where uh, it hadn't reached the point of discipline, and now it has. Maybe you're right, and Todd Bowles is stealing his oats a little bit uh, to an extent that he didn't early in his career. Uh, I'm not entirely sure which it is, but I, I do I do agree with you that it's kind of you know it can get confusing. I remember when when the Giants were dealing with this week to week when Ben McAdoo was suspending a cornerback every week. And somebody I saw somewhere said, well, the team has no discipline. I said, what do you mean no discipline? You suspend somebody every single week. Like, obviously, there's, there's, everyone knows there's consequences. So it can reflect poorly on a coach if people aren't following the rules. Uh, and then that comes to light when he suspends someone for not following the rules. But then, like, what's he supposed to do? He's supposed to let it go so he doesn't look bad. So difficult situation. That is why they get paid the big bucks. Tomorrow we get a couple of games on a football Saturday, which is always a nice thing. And Yeah, how about that? And you get a big one, actually, because tomorrow night in Kansas City, you got the Chargers and the Chiefs, and I guess, Dan, we could pretty much term that one the AFC West Championship, right? Probably. I mean, it seemed like the Raiders kind of checked out of it last week. I mean, you know, it's not all the way over for them if they were to win their last three and, and, uh, you know, somebody else stumbles. But the Chargers are really hot. I mean, they're coming in. Remember, they were 0-4. And they were playing the Giants. Uh, both teams were 0 and 4 uh, in Week Five, and and um, and they won it and they went on a tear. So now they're sitting here tied with Kansas City, who was 5 and 0 uh, at, at 7 and 6 with three games left. And if the Chargers can can get that win tomorrow night, they're in the driver's seat. Obviously, would have control of the division. Uh, and really, you just look at the way that the teams are playing over the past couple of months. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't think they'd be tied, you know. I mean, the, the Chargers have been red hot on offense. The defense with the two edge rushers just dominating um, offensive lines with uh, Melvin Ingram and Joey Bosa. And the Chiefs went through a long stretch where they couldn't get their offense to do anything. So I'm I'm fascinated to see what happens tomorrow night. Is Kansas City back on track, or is uh, Los Angeles really the team to beat in that division after all? Yeah, Chargers a lot better than their record. Remember, four losses by three points or less. So they've really been involved in some nail biters, especially that's early in the season. That's how they do it, though, right? That's, yeah, that's their thing, and uh, and we'll see. I mean, they, they seem to have gotten past that, but it's always kind of lurking out there when you when you try to forecast the Chargers. Big one for the Rams this week. This could go a long way as well towards determining who wins the NFC West. They dropped one earlier in the season to Seattle, but maybe playing the Seahawks right now is not exactly the worst thing in the world, given how banged up they are. Yeah, look, you look at these teams on paper, you look at the way they've played this year, you would say, not knowing anything about history, the Rams should win the game. They, 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 they look like the better team. However, in Seattle, we know how hard a place that is to play. Seattle did win the first game in L.A. It was a close one, it was 16-10, to 10, but they did win. Seattle is a vampire. They are a horror movie villain. 
Like they are not gone until the credits roll. It, it is, it is, it's, it's impossible to feel good about them. Dan, I was driving back from the game I was covering last week, and I had Jaguar Seahawks on the radio, and it was the Jaguars' home broadcast on Sirius, and they were up 14 points in the fourth quarter, and they were terrified. Like, they were convinced that Seattle was coming back on them. And it was like, oh, well, if you don't do this, it, 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 that's how they make you feel. If the Rams can win that game and clear that hurdle, both psychologically and in the standings, that tells you a lot about their readiness to contend for pretty much anything – this very year. No matter what happens, they've had a big year. They'll, they'll probably be in the playoffs uh, and they should feel good about things. But if they can go to Seattle and win, then they may be even better than we think. Give me a quick thought on Aaron Rodgers coming back. They still need a lot of help, of course, if they want to make the postseason. Going into Carolina is not going to be easy. They get Minnesota next week. But yeah. all this talk about, you know, maybe Rodgers isn't doing the wise thing and he risks re-injuring himself. Isn't it his job to be out there? I mean, I can't even believe that people are talking about this. Uh, yeah, look, Ed Rogers is is the Vikings' personal horror movie villain, right? Like right. they would love to have had this clinched by the time he was healthy, and they didn't. I still think they'll be fine, but as long as there's Rogers, there's hope in Green Bay. And uh, I mean, it would be some trick to see him come back and win all three, and then maybe they get the help they need, and and he can do it. I, in terms of his health, I mean, this is not a dumb guy. This is a guy who's who's accomplished a lot, who's well aware of. Um, of uh, of the risks and the long term consequences and and all that about this game, uh, I think he's going into it eyes open. I don't think he'd be playing if he thought there was a significant risk. My understanding is yes. Guys, wouldn't your wife or girlfriend love it if you treated her to the very best this Christmas? Now you can with the world's softest pajamas by Pajamagram, created by a team of pajama experts. The world's softest PJs are lighter than a cloud, softer than a bunny, like cashmere, only better. She'll love how heavenly they feel. Includes free gift packaging and Christmas delivery is guaranteed. So visit pajamagram.com or call 1-800-GIVE-PJs. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. What's going on, everybody? A good Friday afternoon, the 15th day of December, 2017. Dan Gross is sitting in for Stephen A. Here on ESPN Radio, it's 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776, the telephone number. Busy football weekend. We even got ourselves some Saturday football. And I'm not just talking about, like, the garbage Thursday night football that we're used to and we were reminded of again last night, right, with the Broncos and the Colts, and you knew that that wasn't going to exactly be saved in a time capsule and sent off to the Hall of Fame. But tomorrow you get a couple of interesting matchups. You got Bears and you got Lions. Lions still hanging in there in the playoff race in the NFC in terms of the wild card. And then for all intents and purposes, tomorrow night you got yourself what amounts to the AFC West Championship game between the Chargers and between the Kansas City Chiefs out at Arrowhead. It's going to be loud. It's going to be cold. It's going to be rowdy. And we'll talk about all those and more with our pal Dan Graziano of ESPN coming up a little bit later in the program. So a huge Week 15 in the National Football League, not just those games, but of course we have the return of one Aaron Rodgers as he goes into Carolina to see if he can continue to resurrect the Packers' postseason hopes. Need a lot of help, and you got to keep winning, but certainly with number 12 under center, you have yourself a puncher's chance anytime he takes the field. So you got Packers and Panthers, you got the Rams going into Seattle, which you know could also be viewed almost as the championship game for the NFC West to extent because boy if the Rams can get this one and move two up on the Seahawks plus avenge that earlier loss they had against them out at the Coliseum that'll really have them sitting pretty with two games remaining in the season and then you got the two heavyweights the two Titans in the AFC he got the Patriots he got the Steelers and I know you and I were talking about that game earlier in the week I guess it was back on Tuesday after the Pats fell on Monday night against the Dolphins and we had a lot to say about that Patriot Steeler game, and I'll just keep saying it again. You can disagree with me if you want, but I don't think there's any way the Steelers win this game this week. Just because Brady and Belichick have had the upper hand on Pittsburgh pretty much since they've been together. And Brady's numbers against the Pats, or excuse me, against the Steelers are staggering. Absolutely staggering. So we'll get into all those and more with Dan and with you as well. A lot of good football on the agenda here for a week number 15 in the National Football League. And if you want to tweet at me, you can do it at Dan Grasa, G-R-A-C-A. And of course, to be part of the program, it's 866-ESPN, 
76. I want to start with some NBA because last night you had a game over in Brooklyn between the Knicks and the Nets. You know, the cross town rivals, if you will. And I mean, you could call it a rivalry if you want. You could call it a rivalry by geography. That's nice. But I mean, is there really even a rivalry? You know, I keep asking myself that question. Is there really even a rivalry? Because again, last night, you would have thought that game was at Madison Square Garden. You really, you would have thought that it was a Knicks home game because it sounded like a Knicks home game. You know, all the Knicks fans are going to go to Brooklyn and they're going to infiltrate that building and they're going to be rooting hard for the Knickerbockers. And ever, and you know, it reminds me, and I keep thinking back to what is it now? Five years ago when the Nets made the trek over from New Jersey to Brooklyn and all you heard about was, Oh yeah, watch out. Knicks better watch out here. Because the Nets are going to move to Brooklyn. They're going to have a brand new identity. They're going to be able to tap into that Knicks fan base. And they're going to steal some of their headlines, some of their attention, and some of their fans. When is that going to happen, by the way? Right? When is that going to happen? Could somebody give me, like, a definitive date when that's going to happen? Like, is it going to happen next week? Is it going to happen next year? Is it going to happen in five years? I mean, is it going to happen right around the time the Nets win that championship? That Mikhail Prokhorov promised that they would win in the first five years after he bought the team? Or are we still hoping out on that one? You know, are they going to trade away? Is Billy, they going to rehire Billy King? Is he going to trade away about 15 more first-round picks before the Nets get some fans? Are they going to trade away five first-round picks in, in exchange for Nick fans? What are they going to do? But the bottom line is this. Knicks get a road win last night, right? They had to. Only their second one of the season. And, hey, it's a win. A win is a win is a win. You take it. And if the Knicks are going to be a playoff team this year in the NBA, you can't just stock up on home wins. You have to be able to win some games outside of Madison Square Garden. And they've been as bad a road team as there is in the NBA. So for them to win the game last night, they had a big lead, fell behind in the third quarter, and for them to come back and still find a way to get it done is a step in the right direction. It's a positive. Now, the negative. And that's Kristaps Porzingis again leaving this game banged up, sore left knee. They say it's precaution more than anything else, but how many times is this going to keep happening, right? I mean, we're 28 games into the season, and he's already got enough bumps and bruises and aches and pains to really make you concerned, as you should be. This is the unicorn. This is the face of the franchise. This is a guy who, remember, those first 10 games of the season, people were handing him the most valuable player award, right? And he shows you time and time again just how special his skill set is and how lethal a player he is. I mean, think about the things he did the other night against the Los Angeles Lakers in that game at Madison Square Garden. First player in NBA history, the history of the NBA. To put up at least 35 points, 10 rebounds, 5 blocks, and 5 three-pointers in one game. All right, he's seven foot three, and he can play the game like he's a 6-foot point guard. He's a special talent. But you always have to be concerned about his well-being. You always have to be concerned that this guy's going to go down. Now, it remains to be seen if he's going to be able to get back out on the floor in time for tomorrow night's homecoming for Carmelo Anthony, and not to say that it's the end of the world if he doesn't play, but you would like to see him out there, right? As we kind of get a look of the old Knicks guard versus the new Knicks guard with Melo, you want to see KP out there too. The old versus the new. And the Knicks have turned the page. They moved on from the Carmelo Anthony tenure. That's, That's evident. And bigger and better things are expected. You'd like to see KP out there, but not if it's going to jeopardize him not being healthy because he can't keep playing this game constantly worrying that he's going to get injured, he's going to go down, because then what do you have? And that's why I thought last night's game, now granted, they didn't beat the Boston Celtics, all right? they didn't beat Golden State, but I think that still you have to take it as a positive last night because they fell behind in the third quarter. It was kind of shell shock for them. And it was more on the defensive end than anything else. All right? The fact that they fell behind and collected themselves and gathered themselves without Kristaps Porzingis. And, oh, by the way, still without Tim Hardaway. So you got your number one and your number two scoring options down for the count basically the entire second half of that game last night. And they still found a way to win. And Tim Hardaway spoke before the game and doesn't sound like he's going to be back anytime soon. He's going to be reevaluated in another week. And, hey... 
I'm not a doctor. I don't have any inside information. But I think the Knicks are going to proceed with the utmost caution when you're talking about Tim Hardaway. And you're probably not going to see him until 2018 at the earliest. At the earliest. When? I have no idea. But Jeff Hornacek, again, getting contributions from his second unit. You know, that bench last night, 45 points. And they've contributed. Michael Beasley, 15 points. Bringing some energy, bringing some attitude on the offensive end. Frank Nielakina, eight more assists. Continuing to be more comfortable in guiding this offense. And playing important minutes, by the way. Right? Frank Nielakina may not be the starting point guard for the New York Knicks. But guess who's in the game running the offense at crunch time? It ain't Jared Jack. And no knock on him. Right? Frank is getting those minutes late in the game. How about Ron Baker coming off the bench last night and making some big plays defensively, back-to-back strips, which led to a bucket from Courtney Lee and then a three-pointer from Courtney Lee, giving the Knicks some breathing room. You like the makeup of this team. They're gutty. They play hard. And Jeff Hornacek, with each passing game, is showing that he has confidence in those guys on his bench. I mean, it's almost out of necessity at this point, too, when you're talking about the guys who are on the shelf and losing Porzingis. you got to find somebody else to pick up the slack offensively, and last night it was Courtney Lee. And I don't know if they have a third guy that they can rely on night in and night out. It might take a collaborative effort. But this is a fun Knicks team. We say that time and time again. And they probably should be a playoff team. Temple, Green Bay was amongst the worst teams. He's back, top 10 team, that kind of adjustment. Jets right now are tied with the Browns as the worst team in the NFL mm. with his downgrade. Because, again, it's about six points for McCown. I would say Petty is one of the five or seven worst backup quarterbacks in the NFL. So you like the number then with the 16 for the Saints? You know, this is one of the, Dan, this is one of those examples of don't try this at home. You ever watch this TV? Oh, yeah. Stay away. Spinning plates and they're, they're, they're juggling knives. There's (laughs) pros in Vegas that will bet two or three big favorites a year and they know when to do it. I think the best advice for the listeners, anytime it gets to double digits, dog or pass the game. So the Saints spinning plates and juggling knives on Sunday against yeah, the well, Jets, I'm not basically. Sure. I'm not sure enough to know if I want to spin or juggle those knives, so I'm going to pass. <laughs> Jaguars favored by 12 against the Texans. Let down in any way after the game last week against Seattle? This is the biggest favorite for Jacksonville in a decade. So they're not used to being this kind of favorite. It feels like a little bit of a flat spot, especially with Tennessee dropping off. Like, what's the fever? If there's any game in the last six weeks... Jacksonville might not be at a fever pitch. I think it's this one. I also think T.J. Yates, and I do actually ESPN Radio in Houston for years now, every Mm -hmm. week, and down there they were talking about how about half the people they respect think Yates is equal to Savage, and about half the people think Yates is better than Savage. I think unequivocally it's going to be an energy boost. Here's the analogy. Imagine you go to a lunch lunch place that your buddy wants to go to, and three straight times you get a stomach ache after. Now, the fourth time, he says, let's try this other place. Even if this other place doesn't have good Yelp ratings, you're figuring, I've just had a stomach ache the last three times. Let's go somewhere else. That sounds good. Well, in this analogy, we've got Savage is the stomach ache. The team has seen that. Now (laughs) there's a change. So to me, it just invigorates the team. I think Houston plus the points here is a nice value play. Sad thing about it is Tom Savage had way more than a stomach ache when he was lying there in the end zone convulsing last week, which was a scary, scary uh, sight, certainly. Seattle, favored by two against the Rams. Huge game in the NFC West. How do you see that? I really like Seattle here. Not, you know, one of my four or five best picks. Here's the rationale is home field advantage in the NFL is typically three. Seattle has the best home field in the NFL. It's upwards of five. Seattle is better at the end of the year, and it's not even close. This is one of the best end of the year teams you're ever going to see. And then, and actually, here's the stat on it in December, last seven seasons, 21 and seven straight up for Seattle. 21 6 and 1 against the spread. Also, when they're home in competitive games, when the crowd matters more, they actually are 31 and 13 against the spread. So I think this is a situation where if you said, oh, is the Rams a little bit better? I think that's fair to say. So you think, well, 3 to 2 is just a smidge. It's probably the line is right. 
But really, if it's from five to two, I don't think the Rams are three points better. And thus, I do think there's value below a field goal on Seattle. Huge game in Pittsburgh this week. Pats and Steelers, New England playing their fifth road game in six weeks. We know they had the rough one Monday night against the Dolphins. They're favored by three. Do you think the Steelers will finally get a little bit of payback on New England? I don't know about that, but I think plus three is mighty juicy. Yeah, oh yeah. If I bet Pittsburgh, even though I'm a Steeler fan, actually, I will take them losing by one with a big old smile. You've got to, you know, separate your fandom with your wallet. But here's the thing. I think there's only one case to be made for New England here, which is Tom Brady's history against Tomlin. Literally in his career against Tomlin's defense in Pittsburgh, 22 touchdowns for Tom Brady, zero interceptions. Amazing. Almost hard to believe. Now, everything else points to Pittsburgh. If this line were on the neutral, it would be six. If it were in New England, it would be nine. Are you telling me you'd even consider laying nine with New England in New England here? Certainly risky. It's yeah. certainly risky. I mean, now, it's just, is that, now, is that number, by the way, in games in Pittsburgh or just total against to- Tom? Total Lee? games. Total. Okay. Yeah. So I also think here's another situation. is The Steeler team is over 80% winners on the season in the second half of the year. If you look at those teams and then you eliminate Week 17 because you've got a lot of winning teams that sit their starters and all that in Week 17. So the last 30 years – if you take over 80% win percentage, getting three or more at home, there's only been f- three prior teams in 30 years. So this either needs to be a historically bad Steeler team with the record they've got, which I don't think they're historically bad for a record like this. I think they're about average for an 11-2 and two type team. And then, or it needs to be the Patriots are a historically good team in general. Well, we know that's not the case. I think there's real value on Pittsburgh if you can overcome Brady's history against the Steelers. Boy, the Tennessee loss last week has people off the bandwagon. Jimmy Garoppolo, I know he's never lost a start before, and now the Niners are favored by two hosting Tennessee. Yeah, Jimmy G. I tell you, there's some guys in Vegas, they're talking about Jimmy G's jawline, how how handsome he is. I don't even, you know, I guess it's back to the old, you probably remember Moneyball, where yeah. they said, I like guys that have attractive girlfriends as a sign of confidence. <laughs> Apparently, it's a new handicapping factor. Yeah, Jimmy what is G that worth? What is, is the jawline so, worth? Yeah, yeah, Half a point at minimum, it seems. Listen, if you look at this line, this is fascinating. We've talked about the gauge of home field is three. Well, if San Fran's only two at home, or is two at home, it means they're almost as good as Tennessee. A three and ten team against an eight and five team, and Vegas says, "Oh yeah, that 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 three and ten team is a smidge worse." This is total disrespect for Tennessee. I think it's warranted because I think they're probably not overrated anymore, but they were very overrated. And I also think there's two elements to the Jimmy G effect beyond the draw lot. One, he's better on the field, but number two, the team's just excited. And whenever you have teams out of the playoff hunt in the last quarter of the season, you've got to wonder about the team's energy and motivation. I think Jimmy G is given that to the 49ers. I know there's only one game that separates them in the standings, but really a case I think of two teams going in opposite directions, and that's the Cowboys and the Raiders. Dallas goes on the road there Sunday night. They're favored by three in the black hole. I would say in a given season, I bet on Dallas maybe twice, which is not much, because they are a team that has a natural premium. America's team makes them expensive. More people want to bet them. But I actually like Dallas here. I think the Raiders, as you said, I think quite accurately – there's there's trouble in the locker room. There's questions about coaches. You don't know what's going on with his team. It was a home run spot last week against KC, and they didn't play very well. Dallas, on the other hand, has Zeke coming back next week. So there's a sense of hold the line, guys, one more game. And also Sean Lee. When he's on the field, Dallas is certainly in the top half of the NFL when it comes to defense, when Sean Lee linebacker is off the field, literally one of the worst defenses in the league. They've got left tackle Smith back. And if you look at Carr, last six games, seven touchdowns, six interceptions. This one of the best young quarterbacks. Something's wrong in Oakland. I like Dallas lane three. Let's close on this one. And it's easy to overlook them because they're winless. But the Ravens going into Cleveland, last four times they've played them there, they've been one-score football games. Do you think there's any chance that Cleveland keeps this one close again and maybe even gets off the schneid and gets a win? 
Well, listen, if, you, <laughs> if you've been batting the Browns, it's been like you, we've heard it. Scott Van Pelt does his bad beats. This is a horror story of horror stories yeah. week after week with the Browns. But still, I think history says, and you, you touched on some of it, close games between these teams. I also think in general the Ravens probably a little beat up from that Steeler game. So – I I have made a personal commitment not to bet the Browns this year again. I'm, I'm like one in four with them. But I, if I was forced to, I certainly would take the points with the Browns. RJ Bell, founder of pregame.com. Appreciate you playing hurt, my friend. Get well soon, and we'll talk to you next week, all right? I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, RJ Bell, 866-729-3776. We'll get into the NFL. A lot of good ones here in Week 15. Dan Gross in for Stephen A. until the top of the hour here on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! To the top of the hour, Dan Gross in for Stephen A. 866-ESPN, 866-729-3776. And I am stoked for this weekend in football. Really. I mean, it is going to be outstanding. Let's get some housekeeping stuff out of the way here before we get into these games. Number one, uh, to circle back to the basketball theme for a second, Kristaps Porzingis is listed as day-to-day with the sore left knee, and he's questionable for the game tomorrow night against uh, Carmelo and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Meantime, Trevor Simeon. Placed on IR with the shoulder injury, done for the season. He injured himself last night in the game against the Colts. So uh, the Broncos are going to be down to Brock Osweiler, it looks like, for the next couple of games. They've won two in a row here, and they're going to finish probably a uh, good chance still in last place in the AFC West. But those two wins hurt in their draft position come the spring. As far as this weekend's concerned, though, tomorrow night you got the Chargers, you got the Chiefs. That's a huge football game. And I am still not convinced that Kansas City has suddenly righted themselves by beating the Raiders last week. I mean, the Raiders just have not seemed to get it going all season long. And I do not think that that is really any sort of a statement that Kansas City is now back to where they were at the beginning of the year. Look, Kansas City lost a poor game prior to that against the New York Jets, where, yeah, they put up a lot of big plays. You saw the explosiveness back in the offense. But defensively, they're still a complete mess. And this Charger team, you know, they have played really some good football. And if they didn't have those kicking woes early in the season, and as we said with Dan Graziano when he was on, you know, they've lost four uh, four games, four to their six losses by three points or less. So they're right there. This team is stacked with talent. I picked them to make the playoffs at the beginning of the year and it didn't look so good when they started off 0-4. But here they are at 7-6. and And I think they're going to go into Kansas City and win that game tomorrow night. I, I, I really, really do. I like the way this Charger team has gone about things. And they are a dangerous, dangerous club. And that's why... If they get out to an early lead in this game, with those two pass rushers that they have, it could be a long night for Alex Smith and company. Because even though this team has quick strike potential, if you're going to be in obvious passing situations, those guys are going to pin their ears back and just tee off on the quarterback. So it could get really, really dicey for the Chiefs if they fall behind early in this football game. Me and everybody else can't wait to see Aaron Rodgers playing quarterback for the Green Bay Packers on Sunday. They're in Carolina to take on the Panthers. Look, the Packers right now have the odds stacked against them in terms of getting back into the mix for a wild card spot in the NFC because they're sitting there at seven and six. Lions are seven and six. Cowboys are seven and six. Then you got the Seahawks who have eight wins. The Falcons who have eight wins. The Panthers who have nine wins. Saints have nine wins. So, I mean, they have a lot of teams they need to leapfrog. Now look, they're playing one of them in Carolina. So they can draw a little bit closer to them. Next week, they're taking on the Minnesota Vikings. They can't catch them for the division in all likelihood, of course. But you still think that they're going to have to win all of these games if they're going to make the postseason. And then they close out against the Lions on New Year's Eve. So three tough games. They have to win out. They have to get some help. Can it be done? I guess it could be done. But it's not probable. It's possible. But it's still going to be great to have Rodgers playing football. And I know all these concerns about, well, is he is he jeopardizing his well-being? He's a football player. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? And you know as well as I do that if Aaron Rodgers was not going to play and he was deemed medically capable by the training staff and the doctors, he'd be getting killed. He'd be getting killed if he could play and he decided, nah, you know what, I'm going to look out for myself. It's not worth risking this injury again. I've already broken the collarbone twice. Of course he's going to go out there and play. It's the only thing he can do. As far as that Rams and Seattle game, RJ was talking about it when we had him on there. You know, this is a big statement here for the Rams. You know, they've had some good wins this year. 
They've done better than probably a lot of us thought they were going to do at the beginning of the season. This is a game, though, if you want to be taken seriously and you want to win this division, you go into Seattle and you win the football game. That's the bottom line. The Seahawks team is a little bit vulnerable right now. We know how banged up they are on the defensive side of the ball. This is a game that I can easily see the Rams winning. All right, that's an offensive line which clearly has holes. You know the Rams can get some good pressure from up front. Now Russell Wilson has playmaking ability, and he could go out there and do a bunch of things, extend plays with his legs. That's something you always have to be on the guard for. But I think this Rams offense can make some plays and score some points on a Seahawk defense that isn't what it used to be. They're injured. And let's tell it like it is, too. That place is not as difficult to win in like it used to be. Okay, the 12th man, yeah, it's loud, but you could go in there and win. You're a good football team. You could go in there and have success. The Redskins and Kirk Cousins went into Seattle and won a game earlier this year. Remember that. 866-SAY-ESPN, 866-729-3776. We'll talk about the Pats and the Steelers on the other side. It's Dan Gross in for Stephen A. until the top on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Dan Grossin for Stephen A. We're going to the top of the hour here on ESPN Radio. 866-729-3776 is the phone number. Want to get some NFL thoughts here for week number 15. We've got a few minutes for some calls. One baseball note I should tell you guys about. Carlos Santana, the former slugger of the Cleveland Indians, not the guitar player, leaving Cleveland, going to the National League East. But the Philadelphia Phillies, how about that? So Philadelphia... Three years, 60 million bucks for the services of Carlos Santana. Now, look, here's the risky part about it, is that you're banking on this guy is going to be primarily your everyday first baseman. This is a guy who came up, remember, as a catcher. He also did quite a bit of DHing with the Cleveland Indians. Now he's going to go to Philadelphia, and he's going to be entrusted with first base, who, you know, they had Reese Hoskins there for a little bit, of course. They'll probably look to move him maybe to one of the outfield positions. I don't know if Carlos Santana is good enough that I would feel comfortable with him every day with the glove. He has gotten better as a first baseman. I will give you that. But I'm a little bit leery. He's going to hit a lot of home runs in Philadelphia, though. Okay, the way that ball travels in that BAM box at Citizens Bank Park, you can hit a lot of home runs. You don't have to worry about that. But defensively, late game situations... He might find himself in the dugout on the bench because I don't know if you could trust the glove late in games. And that's something that they're going to have to to figure out, Gabe Kapler and his coaching staff, where he best fits. But Philadelphia going out there and spending some money. They also traded Freddie Galvis to the San Diego Padres earlier today. And and, and the funny thing about that, and, and Freddie Galvis is a good little player. I don't know if Freddie Galvis and the move that the Padres made by getting him is going to do anything to enhance their chances of signing Eric Hosmer. Because Eric Hosmer is still out there. And Eric Hosmer is a Boris guy. And all this flirtation by the San Diego Padres with Eric Hosmer, and you've heard it now for about a week, and it just won't go away. And at first you dismissed it as, ah, that's nothing more than just you know a courtesy chat. Or maybe he's using the Padres as leverage to drive up the price from someplace else. Although, when you're talking about San Diego, realistically, how high can they drive up the price? Not much. I mean, the San Diego Padres, you really, and, and, and you think Scott Boris is going to let Eric Hosmer sign for, you know, anything less than $100 million? Really? Eric Hosmer? So, when push comes to shove, I would be stunned, stunned if Hosmer ends up in San Diego. There's reports and people are talking about how Hosmer and J.D. Martinez might be a package deal to the Boston Red Sox. Because remember, Boston's been relatively quiet here. In the meantime, the Yankees have gobbled up all the headlines by getting themselves a John Carlos Stanton, and it seems like in on everybody else and maybe working the phones to see if they can acquire a top-flight starting pitcher via trade, whether it's Garrett Cole, whether it's Michael Fulmer, and on and on and on, because we know that the Yankees are going to have some questions when it comes to their pitching staff, even though that they have probably the most lethal lineup or one of the most lethal lineups in all of Major League Baseball. But the Hosmer thing just does not make sense to me. So we still have a lot of big names who are out there who haven't been signed yet. But that one, boy, that would be the the stunner of all stunners if Hosmer ends up in a San Diego Padres uniform. And he's a gamer. You know, he's a gamer. He's a guy that, you know, is a leader. He's a world champion. He's a gold glover. He's not going to go out there and club 40 home runs. That's not the type of player he is. But he's a good glove. He's a gap-to-gap hitter. He's got a little bit of power. You know, and depending on what ballpark he goes in, he's going to hit 25, 30 home runs, I think. He has that capability, and he's going to get paid. You know that he's going to get paid, and I don't think it's going to happen 
in San Diego. The other thing that happened earlier today, just before we got on the air, and we mentioned it briefly when we had uh, Dan on, Muhammad Wilkerson, who at one time in his career was a Pro Bowl caliber defensive end for the New York Jets, got a big money contract a couple of years ago, and he has been, let's just say, not worth anything close to it in the past couple of seasons. He was disciplined a couple of weeks ago by Coach Todd Bowles for being late, and he sat out the first quarter. Now we get word that when the Jets' plane takes off tomorrow for New Orleans for the game against the Saints, Muhammad Wilkerson won't be on it at all because he was late again today. And, I mean, you talk about some guys just not getting it, right? And this is a guy who has a history of tardiness and lateness and unprofessionalism because he was benched last year, too, and he was disciplined last year, too, when he was late for a Saturday walkthrough practice, which turned out to be a birthday party for him. They had a cake and everything, and he couldn't even show up on time for that. So Todd Bowles... Ruling with the iron fist decides, you know what? Enough of this. And I and I say bravo to Todd Bowles. We know that Muhammad Wilkerson ain't going to be on this team next year. We know he's not. You know, they're going to cut him loose and rightfully so. Forget about the money that they're going to have to eat and the dead money and all that stuff with the cap. The guy is now becoming a cancer to the locker room. But the funny thing is, and you know how sports works, Muhammad Wilkerson is going to have a new change of scenery next year. Somebody's going to take a flyer on him, probably the Patriots, and he's going to go back to being a Pro Bowl defensive end. You know it and I know it. That's going to happen. Just the way the world works. Fun show today. Really was a fun show. And you got yourself an outstanding sports weekend. You know, you keep your nose to the hot stove with the baseball stuff. All the NFL in Week 15. You got bowl mania starting up in college football. Plus Mello coming back to the garden tomorrow night with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Thanks to Nuno. Thanks to Kat. Thanks to RJ Bell. Thanks to Dan Graziano. I'll talk to you again soon. It's Dan Grassa in for Stephen A. Here on ESPN Radio. Have yourselves... A great weekend. Let's go! That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app.